Uh, my talk is Riveting Rails. Um, I just thought I'd give you a little bit of insight into me. Uh, I'm an application software developer. I've uh, been in the financial analytics domain for almost 20 years now. Uh, I've coded in a number of languages, C Sharp and Ruby being my favorites, of course. Um, over the years, I've been able to get involved in some open source. Um, I'm the current maintainer of the Roku build pack for R. Um, I don't know if anyone doesn't know what R is, but it's a statistical programming language. Um, I also have uh, done some small teams for Rails, nothing the, too great. Um, at work, I work for a company called Stackpro, it's an international company, and I'm the architect for their cloud-based uh, analytics pro product called R+. Uh, on the internet, on GitHub, I'm Virtual Static Void, and on Twitter, I'm Virt Static Void, because Twitter has a 15-character limit on the, the username. So confusing. Um, but I really like to think of myself as an eternal newbie, I'm constantly learning. Um, and that's one of the things I love about programming. So riveting rails. Um, what I thought I'd do in preparing for this talk was to share some of my experiences of, of rails uh, and rails um, and the greatness of rails. Um, particularly because I feel that there's a growing trend of, of application developers out there who are seeing that Rails is a very viable solution to line of business type applications, not just your regular internet applications. Um, and of course, choosing a title for, for a talk is really hard when you consider that line of business, um, you, you, you have an application domain that you almost need to convey the message about that first in order to understand the use case. Um, and the complexity of the financial analytics domain is, is really tricky. Uh, it's very con convoluted. So for instance, we have a portfolio model, but a portfolio can also be an instrument, can also be a benchmark, and can, it can be a composite, which is a portfolio of portfolios. Or it could be a unitized product, a product which is a multi-structured portfolio with many different la uh, layers. And so it's really stupid for me to try and think that I can explain all of this in half an hour. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll make up a contrived example and, and work you through, which is sort of characteristic of, of what the kind of issues that I deal with uh, in terms of implementing the kind of complexity um, that my applications have. So. First of all, why Rails? Why Rails in, a, in this kind of domain where, where the application programming is really difficult? Um, and it really is just simple. It's because Rails is the best. Um, compared to um, the experience I've had languishing in ASP.NET and ASP before that, uh, JSP, PHP, and so on, uh, Rails for me was just a complete no-brainer. Um, it's elegant in its syntax. It still has the power of Ruby behind it, um, and it, it just kicks butt on, on everything, as far as I'm concerned. Um, also, it gives me great productivity. Um, I turn around times for developing new features are that much quicker, um, because the patterns are so well established in, in Rails. It also has a great community of very passionate and helpful people, um, and the components for extending the core functionality are so many of them that it becomes a very compelling framework to use. Uh, it's simple in appearance, um, but complex inside, which is also what Matt says of, of Ruby. Um, and ultimately, it's about developer happiness, and which is what Ruby's mantra is as well. So with all the positives, uh, Rails certainly is the, the framework for my next killer application. Um, and in no time, well, I hesitate to use this now after the previous talk, <laughs> but in no time I had a product. Um, it was 
maximum viable product. Um, <laughs> um, my clients were really happy and they were giving me great feedback. Um, and before I knew it, um, oh, well, fast forward a couple of months, um, I discovered and I started getting this growing sense of something was not quite right. Um, my application has become really big and really cumbersome. Um, I had a lot of models, with a lot of associations and validations, lots of before, around, and after callbacks, lots of queries with many different parameter combinations um, for my user interface, using single table inheritance for some of those pesky portfolio problems, um, and then, of course, sprinkled with lots of data dependencies between all the models, and then nicely interlaced with lots of business logic. Also, lots of controllers and lots of views, because my users love views. They want lots of charts and grids and drill downs and master detail and lots of uh, linking between multiple screens. Um, so we have this big ball of mud, essentially, at the end of the day. And coupled with our complex domain logic, uh, it became very hard for new developers to come on board to help out um, and to be able to understand the domain as well as the application or implementation of that domain. This domain is one where I say the exception is the rule. Um, every time you think you know something happens and somebody says something, you realize you actually don't know it. Um, so it's pretty nasty. Uh, and we get to a situation where our rails isn't quite working. <laughs> So Rails has served its purpose well to this point. Um, and so I started looking out to see, well, what are the alternatives? I've got to this point now, I've got a good client base. I've got the financial backing now to, to, to go out and find what is the right framework for my problem. Um, but I really do need help. Um, so I started doing a whole lot of research um, into application architectures um, and different design patterns. Um, and I discovered all these things. And clearly, there are a lot of people out there grappling with the same problems. Um, and it's really difficult to make sense of all of this, uh, trying to be idiomatic at the same time. And then it doesn't help with DHH coming out saying that he doesn't have a compelling reason to see why service objects are, are something which is needed. Um, and, and that just confused me. Um, he also said uh, over, extraction, over abstractions result in uh, not so simple and incomprehensible code uh, or a dense jungle of service, op uh, service objects and command patterns and worse. Um, so I was really confused and, and I, it just seemed like the right approach for me was to uh, just to continue where I was um, because um, I had clients using my product and, and it was just difficult to, to move off. Um, and this fear of over-abstraction kind of crept in as well, and, and I started limiting my design choices um, because I wanted to follow the Rails way. Uh, I wanted to continue doing idiomatic things and also part of risk mitigation with bringing new developers on board who are familiar with Rails from other organizations. I don't want to deviate too much from the Rails way. Um, and so we, or I, carried on with the, what I call the DHH-oriented rails um, and, and dug myself further and further into oblivion. Um, and it was around that time where my tests started to fail me. They weren't providing the security blanket that I needed to, to do refactoring because they were too complex and they were too coupled with my business logic and all these models and so on. Um, and it was about then that I saw another tweet from DHH where he spoke of preemptive programming being the wrong way to apply your patterns. And, and this is when the realization hit me that if I refactor my application really slowly and I only introduce the patterns as and when I need them, that that might be the solution. Also, uh, a really good book called Growing Rails Applications in Practice um, presented this graph where you have this exponential pain if you continue to use vanilla rails. 
versus introducing some structure. Uh, and this gave me some hope because I really love Rails, I really love Ruby, and um, looking into the alternative solutions was, was um, quite evident that I would have to give some of that up and my developer happiness would be affected. So my mission changed to one of being to keep it simple and to grow as needed. Um, and my starting point was to focus on my business logic because after all, that is the heart of my application. And Rails, after all, is, is, is just a user interface framework. Um, and introducing structure would, would be able to um, facilitate this. And so I've created a little example. So I have this fat model, the user model, a little bit contrived. It has some order relationship, has some validations, it has some welcome email logic um, with an uh, after create. It has some what seems to be display logic in there, uh, and also some order processing logic. So we've got a whole lot of things, a lot of many concepts all mixed up together. Um, so what is wrong with this? Um, and, and quite simply, it's actually a separation of concerns problem. My model has got too much knowledge about my domain. It's doing too many things. Um, so what do I do about that? Well, most people will go and try and find a gem to solve it. Um, I was a bit loath to introduce some more dependencies into my application, already complex application. And so the decision there was that it wasn't a good idea. And instead, when looking at my FAT model, I started to think, well, how can I carve out this functionality while still keeping to the Rails convention? So the first point was to look at my model as a, just a persistence mechanism and to keep it to an absolute bare minimum, to only put the logic in there that is absolutely required. So in my case, uh, orders relationship and a validation of uniqueness on an email. Next, I looked at, well, there's a process where my user can sign up and at which point he needs to have a password and accept terms and conditions and send a welcome email. So it made sense to abstract that logic out. And I discovered, well, this is actually a form model that I've created, although I'm still just inheriting from the user base class. Next, looking at the view logic I abstracted out, um, a view model which abstracted the, first, the full name functionality and a query that gave me a list of outstanding orders. And that's my presenter model. Next, looking at the, some of the business logic in this model, um, I extracted out the order processing logic uh, into a kind of a service object uh, with an initializer which takes the user and the order and then performs the, the, the logic. And I thought that was pretty fancy. <laughs> and it's all just Rails. I haven't introduced any uh, special base classes or any uh, gems that um, introduce that functionality. It's really just simply moving things around a little bit. Um, so for instance, if you look here, the user model sits in app models. And then I created a subdirectory under models called user. And then each of the nested subclasses within that user namespace then encapsulated each of those different concerns of the model. Um, it also made my tests a lot more easy to write. Um, and it also provided a level of isolation between each different concept and different aspect. Um, and for new developers coming on board, if they were only interested in, say, writing the view part of my models, then they would only look at the as show model. And it's really straightforward. And the tests behind that are really straightforward. So mission accomplished. Uh, now, in case of rolling that idea out through the domain, um, took place and had developer happiness again. So my takeaway from this was abstract your domain properly. Um, but fear of over abstraction was, I guess, incorrect in that I was, it was a fear of technical over abstraction. And that really wasn't my problem. My problem was my domain wasn't abstracted properly. 
for the talk to be complete, um, there are gems out there which can help. Um, so if you look at the form space, you've got gems like Informal and Virtus, Active Type and Reform. On the presenter side of things, there's Active Presenter and Draper. Um, and they have some rich functionality, especially around collection handling. Uh, then on the service object type models, you've got Light Service and Interactor. I bolded the ones that I believe are the, the better ones. Um, and then there's a growing slew of frameworks coming out. Um, Nick Sutterer, who spoke um, a couple of years back at Reviewer, um, is working on a, a framework called Trailblazer, and a company book with that explaining his ideas. Uh, and then myself, I've, I've written a little gem called Riveter, hence the name of my talk. Um, which abstracts some of these into nice little um, small chunks. And then lastly, the uh, if it's wrong, make sure it's consistently wrong mantra is how you actually get by. <laughs> because when it comes to refactoring, um, even though my domain was a big ball of mud, my application was a big mess, I've done it in a consistent mess. So it was fairly easy to introduce these simple changes um, and get to a point where my application, I felt good about it again and develop the happiness. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I've, I've put together a list of resources um, explaining some of the types of things that I looked through and encountered and read about. Um, Rails, the missing parts, is quite a good Hacker News uh, Y Combinator post, which um, piqued my interest and, and I got to see a lot of differing opinions on that one. Um, also, in terms of different architectures and techniques, obviously very context dependent. You need to put them in the context of your, your business domain uh, and to see which of these are relevant to you. Uh, hexagonal being the most topical, I guess, at the moment. Um, and also Uncle Bob uh, with clean architecture. Um, and then a great thing about open source is that there's a plethora of frameworks out there, but le less so applications. Um, so I'm always on the hunt for real-world applications which are, aren't just your Hello World or To-Do app, or, um, and that are a little bit more meaningful. Um, and you can learn a great deal by going through the, the code of these um, libraries and, uh, sorry, applications, uh, and to learn how they've gone about solving some of the problems of abstracting. Um, also, there's some good books out there. Objects on Rails is, is a good one. Practical object oriented design, and obviously I mentioned Growing Rails Applications was really a good book. Uh, and it gave me a lot of tools and ammo to, to tackle my problem. Right, so any questions? Yes? Technical analysis. Not familiar, sorry. <coughs> Anyone else? Uh, yes. Yes, so the controller will, um, for instance, in the, cre uh, the create method, will instantiate that, that subclass. Um, yeah, I guess we could have a debate about whether, you know, whether that's good or bad, but in, in essence, since that subclass inherits from the user model in that example, I don't see it as being any different from instantiating the user model. No. Yes. All right. Thank you.